A little bit of review. Week one, we talked about setting priorities. Priority number one was God. Priority number two was our spouse. And, and I'll say this again. We are talking about marriages that are in this room. Any relationship that was previous to the one that you're in now, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about marriages that's in this room. I think too many times we get caught up in, in, uh, in the past and dwelling on what happened and how this messed up. We're talking about marriages that are in this room. So if you do have a previous marriage, we all have previous relationships. Let me just put it that way. And, uh, and, and we can't take those mistakes that were made or the things that happened in those and, and bring them into our marriages today. So um, when we're talking about this and when we're, we're looking at, at what's going on right now, we have to remember that God is speaking to us where we are, not where we've been. Okay? Um, week two, we talked about building tra- foundations. We talked about transparency. Divine marriages, God being in that marriage and making it divine. And, and we looked at the Garden of Eden and how they were naked and unashamed. There was nothing between them. Uh, week three, we talked about avoiding snares. That's going to come up again today. And what we're looking at, we talked about deception. Greener grass for, for ladies is, is the snare that Satan uses to, to, to make you look elsewhere, to make you look for something that's better than what you have. Passivity is the snare that Satan uses to, to men. And he, he uses that to break us down and to cause us to be less confident than we should and, and to not lead our families the way that God has called us to. Week four, we talked about managing expectations. We had the box up here of desires, and we talked about how we move those over to expectations, and then it turns our marriage into a bondage type marriage, moves it from a covenant to a contract. And that is no way to live in a marriage. There's no way that you can do that and have unconditional love in our marriage. And, and I think that's so important. When we go back to that, we think about what our marriage relationship looks like. And we look at the picture of Christ and His church. And there's so much unconditional love in that. And, and today, we, we're living in a world where it's all about contracts and negotiations. And you do this, and I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. And I'll do this if you'll do this. And... And I'll take care of you if you take care of me. No, that's not what marriage is about. It's not what it's about. It's about unconditional love. It's because I love you because of what Christ has done for me. You love me because of what Christ has done for you. And so it's all about our relationship with Him and not even about the relationship in, that with our spouse in front of us. Everything that happens there is because of my relationship with Him. And that's how we keep that priority right. Everything goes back to God. Everything is, stands there in, the, in our our marriages, our covenant relationships with our spouse should be full of unconditional love. And to be full of unconditional love, that means there's a lot of mistakes. A lot of things happen. A lot of mistakes are made. I mess up a ton. She messes up a ton. And we still love each other. Okay? Full of unconditional love. That's how God meant for it to be. And He's shown us so many times His unconditional love for His people. And that should be the same, the same thing that we show in our marriages. Two weeks ago, we talked about the great submission, uh, our relationship to God, our relationship is God honoring when we submit one to another. When I submit to, to Nikki and Nikki submits to me under God, in reverence to God, in respect for Him, because we love Him and worship to Him, we submit to each other, and then we follow the the, the model that He's laid out for us. And there's no way that a marriage relationship of two people cannot have a head. It has to have a head. If everything goes to a vote, it ends 1-1. There has to be. It it doesn't work. And God laid it out for the husband to be the head and and to lead his family. And so we talked about that and we looked at that. He, He gave the man the command to love his wife as Christ loved the church, to lay down his life for her. And he gave the woman the command to respect her husband, to revere him. To, to follow him. And so, as we look at that, man, we've covered a lot of stuff, haven't we? We really have. There's, this is a ton. And uh, there's so much that the Word of God has to say about our marriages and our marriage relationships, directly and indirectly. And so we're going to continue on. And, and I think today, when we go through those, uh, those, those first five things, the next three weeks, we're gonna, today we're going to look at 
how we deal with each other. And then next week we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, purity. And and I know that's kind of weird. We're in marriage relationships, but our world is so impure, unbelievably impure. And our marriages are full of impurity. And so we're going to talk about that and talk about what, what, uh, what God calls us to be and talk about the way that the world is taking us away from that. So we're going to talk about that next week. And then the week after that, we're going to deal with conflict. We'll be eight weeks into this thing, nine weeks into this thing, eight, eight lessons in. And I'm pretty sure that we're probably going to deal with some conflict between one and seven. So in, in week eight, we'll talk about, session eight, we'll talk about dealing with conflict and how every marriage is full of it, and we have that, and we need that, and we need to grow from it. So just to kind of give you a heads up, that's where we're going, um, so, you, so you know where we're at. This week, we're going to jump around in, in the Word of God. We're going to start off in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, and um, so you can go ahead and flip over there with me. To 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. We're going to concentrate this morning on um, a particular part of verse 7. And I'll read it and then I'm going to pray. Um, the beginning of verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Goes on to say, giving honor to the wife as, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers not be hindered. What I want us—we can take so much out of this verse. It's, it's full of stuff here, but really, what I want us to look at this morning and take this portion of scripture because I think it's extremely important in our marriages today and in our relationships. It says, "Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge." Okay. If we're dwelling together according to knowledge, what does that mean? That means that we need to learn our spouses. We need to study them. We need to find out what it is that makes them uh, uh, different, that makes them who they are. And so that's really what I, I want us to look at this morning because so many times we live our marriages and we have no idea who the other person across from us is. I mean, we don't know. We, we dated and we got to know each other and then we got married and we don't know. We, we have stopped learning. And it's time for us to go back to school. It's time for us to spend some time learning what it is that's important to her. Learning what it is that's important to him. What makes him tick? What makes her tick? What makes him how he, be the way that he is? What makes her be the way that she is? And so it's time that we learn something, okay? So we're going to look at that. Let's pray and just ask God to open up His Word to us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just come to You today in awe and in reverence of, of everything that You've done for us, God. I just, <laughs> I praise You for giving us new beginnings, God. I praise You for giving us time here on earth, God, to take the things that You've taught us and to share it with other people. God, I just praise You for Your many, 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 times that you've given me so much grace and so much mercy undeserved and God I just ask that you pour that into my marriage God show me through my relationship with you how I am to act as a husband God this morning I just want you to open up your word and to show us what we should do to the, the best way for us to, to learn to grow God you know me better than anybody you know Nikki better than anybody so for me to understand her, God, I just ask that it comes from you, the, the one that knows her more than anybody. And I love you, Lord, and I thank you for everything that you've done, and I just ask that you just bless it this time, move me out of the way, and you speak directly into each and every life this morning. We just love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here's what we're talking about. Basically, we're talking about his needs and her needs, okay? And, and there are things here that are extremely important, some kind of general, and there are a lot of things that need to be discussed. Okay? Everything that we talk about in this class is for the most part in general. If you're not going home and spending time together and learning specifics from each other, 
then you're not getting the full effect of what's happening. Okay? Very, very important that you take what we talk about in here and you take it home and you, and you find out exactly from your spouse how God's made them. Okay, so what does he need? Let's talk about him first, okay? Ladies, we're going to talk about him. What does he need? Um, I'm going to give you two things that he needs. This is easy. Two things, right? Two things. This is what he needs. Uh, the first thing is reverence. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, we have, we've read it many times. And just flip over there, we'll look at it. Ephesians 5.33 says, Nevertheless, let every one of you particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Um, you can read a lot of books, and you can read a lot of things, and, and you can come up with a lot of things that he needs. I'm going to tell you this morning that this is the main thing. This is number one. There's nothing else above this. The number one thing that your husband needs is respect from you. Everything else falls under this. Everything else goes with this. The number one thing that he needs is respect from you. A spiritual reference could be described as a radical amazement. Think about that. Are you radically amazed by your husband? And I know I'm, I'm not asking that out loud. Please don't say it. Um, more than likely not. But just think about that. Think about how that would make you feel, husband, if you felt that your wife was amazed by you. That, was, that she was in awe of you. When we talk about revering God and respecting God, we're in amazement by him. We're in awe of him. So, I want you to think about this. And you could be sitting there and you could be thinking right now, he's nothing to be amazed about. And he's probably not. <laughs> but, <laughs> there, there's something to this, ladies. There's something to this. I promise you that if you will catch on to this, and you will make this true in your life, and you will show him how amazed you are by him, that he will become amazing. And see, here's the thing. This is I'm not going to do this, but I'm going to jump on a soapbox. I absolutely hate television. The main reason I hate television is because of the lack of respect there is for a man. There's a lot of junk on TV. There's a lot of things that drive me nuts. But the one thing that, that, that drives me more crazy than anything is when I watch a Home Depot commercial and I see a man look like a retard by his wife. And I shouldn't use that word. I'm sorry. But... You, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? I mean, they take a man and they make it dumb him down so much that it looks like he's completely incompetent to do anything. And that's not what God created. Okay? God created a man to lead his family. God created a man to be the head of his house. God created a man to rule the world. Do you understand? Everything that was created is underneath us. And God created us to be, for everything else to be in subjection to that. It, it doesn't line up. And it really, really, really frustrates me to see that. And I'm sorry. But that's where I am. And it, it really drives me nuts. And... Um, can't stand the television shows that do it. I can't stand the, the commercials that do it. It's just, it's ridiculous what we've done to, to see what, to dumb down what God has, has done for us and that He's planned for us. Anyway, let me get off that. I shouldn't have went there, but you guys know what I'm saying. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 10 through 16. You don't have to turn there. You can if you want. But I want to read this to you. 
This is really cool. This is a, a portrait that a bride speaks of her bridegroom. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like the lilies, drop, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon the sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, as excellent as the cedars. His mouth is as most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is a bride responding to the daughters of Jerusalem that ask, what's so great about him? What I want you to understand this morning, ladies, is that when you respond this way to what's so great about your husband, his confidence goes through the roof. Everything about him becomes stronger. We talked about a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks back, that his, what, what, what is it that his snare is? What is it that his struggle is? Anybody? Passivity. Thank you. Passivity, right? Do you realize that when you speak things of life into him, when you speak life into him, when you speak encouragement into your husband, that that passivity just falls away? It goes away. That no longer takes takes that away from him. It it it, it takes away the things that he struggles with. And when you speak life into him, that's what happens. But then there's the flip side of that. When you play like he's not worthy, when you dumb him down, when you talk to him the way that the world teaches us to talk about your husband and talk about men in general, that passivity just explodes. He becomes more passive. And it destroys the man that God has given you. When you speak down to your husband, you'll get exactly what you're speaking of. Not to him, not even just to him, but even about him, to somebody else. We talked in week two about things being completely up and transparent. What if, what if he saw every message you wrote to your sister, to your friend, or to your mom? What if he saw every conversation that you had with somebody else? How would he feel? Would he feel like he's one that shouldn't be passive? Like he's worthy of leading your home? Like the man that God made him to be? Or would he feel worthless? Would he feel like what you described him as? There's so much here that if we can grab a hold of this, ladies, if you can get this, and understand that the words that come out of your mouth speak life or death into your husband, your whole world will change. Y'all with me? All right. I'm going to give you the second thing that men need. And you all know what it is. We talk about it all the time. We say it's all they need, but it's not. I'm telling you. Physical intimacy is the number two need in your husband's life. It is an extension of the first need. And the reason that I say that is because man is made with a chemical makeup that physical contact uh, gives him a, a sense of, of worth. Okay? It takes what we're physical people and everything that you say is one thing, but when it's physically translated, it means something totally different. You understand what I'm saying? So it's really an extension of the respect. It's really an extension of the reverence, but it becomes in that physical contact that he, uh, that he wants, that he needs. Okay? I'll give you a couple of things. And this is just, guy, I'm trying to help you out in your marriage. All right? And we get uncomfortable talking about this, and we shouldn't, but we do. 
We make men feel like pervs. We do. Because we say that's all they want. That's all they ever talk about. That's all, you know, that's, that's all that's in their mind. Well, it, it is. <laughs> I mean, it's not the only thing, but yes, it's there. I mean, it is there, okay? It's there. And God created us that way, and I believe that he created us that way for a reason. Well, I know that he created us that way for a reason, okay? And, and I'm going to explain some things, husbands, to help you out in this area later on and to help your marriage out. But wives, I want you to understand that your husband is not abnormal. I mean, it's normal, okay? It's normal. And husbands, I see so many men that are um, that beat themselves up that they shouldn't because it is normal. And God gives us that drive. And men are physical creatures. Here's what I want to share with you this morning. I want to give you three reasons why it's so important. And it's really not the, the reasons that you think. The reason number one that sex is so important to your husband is that there are so many things, so many things that it fixes. You can be having the worst day of your life. And there's that, they can fix it. I'm, I'm telling you, I promise you this, okay? <laughs> it can fix many, many, many things. You can be exhausted from work. You can hate everything about your life away from your marriage, and it, that just fixes it. It fixes it. It's, it's a, it's a, I heard one guy say it's a great oasis in the world of life. You're living life, and this is your oasis, okay? So, yeah, it's really, really important, okay? <laughs> Number two, the second reason that it's so important is because it, it gives a closeness. And I talked about this just a little bit. Men are physical. And when you have that closeness together, being physical, that's as close as you can get, right? Right? And when you have that closeness together, there's so much trust, there's so much intimacy built in that, it builds so much confidence in your relationship together. Men being physical creatures, when you have that closeness, it just builds the confidence. It, it takes away passivity. It gives them the things that they need to, to lead, to be the kind of man that you want them to be. The third reason is because it, it's neat. It, God made us that way. I'm just going to say that, and there's a lot of people that say that, and you're like, whatever. No, really, God made us that way. There, there's been study after study after study that shows that God just made us that way. And that when we go without that, things diminish in our lives. There are studies that show that it, and, and after three days without sex, a man's mind starts to go. Some of you are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> three days. <laughs> after three days, his concentration suffered, suffers, his decision making suffers. He becomes irritable. He becomes impatient. And so on and so on and so on. I don't know why. <laughs> I can't tell you why. Well, I really I do know why. It's because of the way that we feel. And here's the thing. God gave us this, this desire to be close to a woman. And he gave us this desire to be uh, this or this 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 way of feeling to be physical. And so when we have that physical closeness, I want you to think about if that if some if you feel close to somebody and you go three days without feeling that closeness, you start to separate, right? You start to separate after so long. It might not be three days. It might be whatever. But after you go a certain period of time, 
you begin to separate and you begin to lose some things. And I want to tell you that God has, has given your man a, a, a desire to be physically intimate. Okay? And that's in him. And what it does is it brings closeness together with you and him. And that is his desire. And when we don't make this a priority in our lives, and when we don't make this very high in our priority scale, and that we show that this is important to us, then what happens is, honestly, ladies, I'm just going to be straight with you, you're sending your husband into a world that does not care about you and does not care about your relationship with your husband. And let me ask you something. If his decision-making, if his concentration, if the things that, that are in his mind that keeps him the person that you want him to be are lacking and he goes into a world that does not care to put anything in front of his face, there's going to be some bad decisions made. There's going to be things that are, that are decided that shouldn't be. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all with me? This is important. This is huge. <clears throat> Let me give you one other thing here. Along this line. When I say that your husband needs physical intimacy, there is a fulfillment level there for him. And there is a lie in this world that says that um, he can be fulfilled without you being fulfilled. It's a lie. It's 100% false. There is no level of fulfillment for him unless it's mutual. Y'all with me? You understand that? Because that's a lie. It's something that you get told as a woman that is a lie. Okay? Just straightforward. The fulfillment that he needs involves you. Okay? Everybody with me? I don't have to go any further there, right? All right. Now, that's what he needs. He needs respect and he needs physical intimacy. It's really about it. Beat him every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Best way to get to your man? Never mind. Yeah. You bring a sandwich to the bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Golly. Take me serious. Uh, shows him. Shows, shows you respect and physical intimacy right there. <laughs> All right. Now we get a little more difficult here. It's probably easier for you, ladies, but a little more difficult for us. I'm going to give you four needs of a woman, and here's the thing. You might be sitting here thinking about these, and you might hear three of them, and you're like, no, this is not me. When I give these four needs, I'm not saying that all four of these needs are your top four needs. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is one of these four are your top need. Um, one of these four is your wife's top need. For, see how much easier it is for me? If there's only one. <laughs> You've got to figure out which one of these is the top need for her. <laughs> this is why it says husbands un live with your wives in an understanding way. You have to learn. You have to grow. You have to learn what it says. All right, security, number one. Not letter A. Let me do it that way so that I don't put order in these. These are not in order. Security, and when I say security, I'm speaking of three different kinds of security. I'm speaking of financial security, relational security, and physical security. Okay, these are three separate things that fall under the security. You can give two of these and not three, and she doesn't feel secure. You can give one of these and not the other two, and she doesn't feel secure. You have to give all three of these. Okay, all three of these are separate, but together. Your hus husband's, your lady needs to know that you can take care of her. She needs to know that you can take care of her financially, relationally, and physically. Okay? She needs to know that when the guy, when, okay, here it is. 
2 a.m., there's a noise, she wakes you up, go see what it is. <laughs> it's nothing. I know it's nothing. I know there's nothing out there. Just go look. It's not that big of a deal. Just get up and go out there. <laughs> That's physical security. When you do that, husband, when you do that, you're showing her, I'm going to take care of you. Because she really thinks it's something. I mean, she really does. It might be. It might be. But anyway, go look. That includes the killing of all insects. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) See, I I didn't even have that in my notes. (laughs) Don't have me to do it. You should should kill every bug in that. All right. Physical. It's really important. And for us, men, that's probably the only natural thing that a woman needs that you have. That, that's, it really is. <laughs> Everything else you got to work on. <laughs> um, all right. Relational. This is important. Relational security is, is that she knows that you're going to be there. Okay? She knows that your relationship is secure. She knows that you're not going to leave. She knows that you're not looking to leave. She knows that you're not looking for somebody else or that you're not looking to, to move on. It's really important. How do we do this? We tell them constantly, baby, I'll never leave. I'm not going anywhere. If you leave, I'm going with you. Okay? <laughs> Don't bring the kids. <laughs> Don't bring the kids. <laughs> Relational security. Relational security. Showing them that you will be there. You'll be there with them. Financial security. This is a, a toughie, and I know that in our world today uh, of dual income homes, that this is this is really hard. And to and to say that I can make my wife feel financially secure when both of us make the money that pay the bills is very difficult. I'm not talking about that you make her feel financially secure to the point that she can have the biggest house and she can drive the nicest car and that she can have all this. That's not the security that she needs. The security that she needs from you as a husband is to know that if everything goes wrong and everything messes up and she can't go to work and and, and, and whatever happens, let's not even put anything in there, but if whatever happens, you, you can provide and you can take care of things. Understand? That's the financial security that I'm talking about. All right, there's a level of financial freedom, financial freedom and financial security, two totally different things. All right? So to feel financially secure is to know that, you know what? If things got bad, my husband would get off his rump and go out there and do whatever it needed to be done to take care of our family. That's what financial security is. You with me? Okay, I don't want to get messed up on that because that's really a tough spot because so many of us look at it and say, well, if, if, if I'm financially secure, then I'll never have to work a day in my life. I mean, that might be true, but if you want certain things, you might have to. But to be financially secure means that my husband will, will do what it takes to, to take care of us, to put up our four walls. Or for walls being food, transportation, clothing. What did I say? Huh? Shelter. Shelter. And you mind. Dave Ramsey folks back there. No <laughs> All right. So security. We got that one right. We got three more to go. Uh, B. Letter B. Conversational companionship. Okay. Conversational companionship does require you to turn off ESPN. You cannot have the kind of conversational companionship that is important to her with your head in the TV. Okay? You cannot have the kind of conversational companionship that you need to have with her with kids laying in your bed. You cannot have the kind of conversational companionship that is important to her when your mind is somewhere else. This takes effort. Okay? This takes effort. There are two things that you should plan to do. 
and that you need to do as a husband. Now, this is not for your wife. Straight up, let me tell you, if she does this, it doesn't mean anything. This is for you, husband. Dates planned by who? You. Trips planned by who? You. I don't care if she's the best travel agent in the world. Okay? I don't care if she loves planning getaways. You plan a trip. Just a getaway, just one night. Just something. Just to show her that you want to be alone with her. That you want to spend time with her. You saying, okay, yeah, that's good with me. Where do you want to, okay, whatever. That, that is not it. Okay, that doesn't work. It doesn't work for you two to get in the car and say, all right, where do you want to go? No. You get in the car and you know where you're going. You know what you're doing. And so she doesn't have to think about any of that. And then when you get there, it's all about conversation. It's all about spending time with her. It's all about being a companion. You know when you did this? You know you used to do this, by the way. <laughs> Every one of you used to do this. It's called dating. Right? Am I wrong? You all with me? We used to do this. We used to spend time trying to get along. Trying to spend time together. Why? Because you wanted to? See if you had a future together. See if you had a future together. Which would be learning each other. Let me ask you something. Do you think I'm the same person I was 15 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my brother, by the way. I got him out of <laughs> No, I'm not. I'm not. Absolutely not. You're not either. You're not the same person you were when you were dating. You're not, you, you don't have the same thoughts. You don't have the same fears. You don't have the same goals. You don't have the same ambitions. You don't have the same purpose. You're, basically, nothing's the same as it was when you were dating. How are you going to know what's important to her? How are you going to know what she's dreaming, what she's feeling, what she wants, if you don't ever spend any time talking to her? This is so, so, so important to her. <coughs> See, you think it's not important because you don't ever think about it. Well, you will think about it one day when you've been married for 25 years and you don't know each other and the kids are gone, and then who are you? This is extremely, extremely important. Let me tell you what it does. We talked a few weeks ago about the snare that Satan uses on women. What was it? Greener pastures. This is watering your own lawn. When you spend the time to fertilize and water your grass, there is no greener grass. You understand what I'm saying? If you allow this area to not be important in your life, what you're allowing her to do is to have conversations with somebody else and to see a grass that's greener somewhere else where somebody will listen to her. Affairs on the side of a woman starts with this. Extremely, extremely important. Water your grass. Conversational companionship. C. Significance. Significance. Extremely, extremely. All four of these are important. Extremely important. One of these is your wife's number one need. You don't know which one right now, so make sure that you're writing down and you understand these things, okay? <laughs> Show your wife her value. I don't think I could ask any man in here today 
whether or not your wife is valuable to you, I don't believe one person would say, nah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. She's valuable. She's valuable. You better tell her she's valuable. You better show her she's valuable. With your words, with your gifts, and with your actions. Show her what she means to you. Let me ask you something. Just think about it this way, man. Think about your job, where you work. Think about, you You do everything for your company. You might not be a good employee, but let's just pretend right now you're a good friend. Employee that okay? Let's pretend that you, the, if you left, the place would literally fall apart. Let's pretend that, okay? Literally, it would fall apart. Because when we're looking at our marriages, it, it would fall apart, right? So let's pretend. Let's put ourselves in that. We can't actually be in that boat, but let's put ourselves in that boat. If I left, it would fall apart. But your boss never gives you any kind of inkling that you're significant to the company. How do you feel? You had a raise in 27 years. He's never told you good job. Guys, I don't understand how we know what stuff feels like, yet we still don't. We don't communicate it the other way. I mean, I know how I would feel. I know how I would feel, because literally, if I left my job, it really would fall apart. <laughs> and if there wasn't any appreciation on the other side, I would leave. If I wasn't shown any significance... Why would I be there? Husbands, why in the world are we not showing our wives how significant they are to us? How significant they are in our marriage? How significant they are in our family? Yet we don't do it. For the most part, we do not do that. We fail here so much. I fail here so, so much. And I already know that it's my wife's number one need. Very disturbing. Letter D. Here's where I'm going to help you. <clears throat> this is a need of your wife. Affection. Non-sexual affection that leads to sexual affection. It starts as none. Hugs. They're important to her. Did you know that? She likes to be hugged. <laughs> You're sitting there and you think, I don't care if I ever get hugged again in my life. <laughs> Take it or leave it. <laughs> really important to her. It really, really is. A hug can melt away things for her. You walk into the kitchen and she's had a terrible day. The kids are ridiculous. You got one of two choices. You can hug her or you can kill the kids. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> When you hug her, it takes that away. Now, when you're hugging her, you want to do this, right? <laughs> kicking, the, kicking the kids back, okay? We've got two little boys. They want to be right there in the hug. You know? <laughs> Give me some of that love. Give me some of that love. That's what Sam says. Give me some of that love. <laughs> when, when we take away this uh, conversational companionship, and I told you that that's what leads to affairs, when we take that away from our marriages and we take that out of our marriages, we don't have affection, we don't have um, uh, any, any type of non-sexual affection in our marriages, then what that conversational companionship does with somebody else other than you is it leads to non-sexual affection. 
and then our fire begins. That's how it starts. Okay. Now, I'm going to say no woman, but maybe there is. No woman begins an affair for the need of sex. It's because of the need of companionship and affection. There are studies that show that it's well into the 90% range that, that affairs for a woman starts because of companionship and affection. Non-sexual affection has absolutely nothing to do with sex. Very huge warning. I hope that you take that. That's big, guys. Just think about that. I mean, we're talking about things that, that will cause Satan to, uh, to put in front of your wife another relationship. Just, I hope we're, we're understanding this. Now, here's where I want to help you. There's a circle. I should draw it. That's all right. I don't want y'all to move. There's a circle in this whole thing. And on the top is affection. And on the bottom is sex. They're both on the circle. She needs one of them. You need the other one. You understand what I'm saying? They go together. When you show her affection, it makes her want sex. When he gets sex, it makes him want to show you affection. Y'all with me? This is a two-way deal. To where it's only fulfilled if everybody is in the circle. You get what I'm saying? We all got to be there. One leads to another. 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 Continually. Where do we start? Ooh. Ooh. I got my vote. No. <laughs> Where do we start? Where do we start? That's a big question. It's an easy answer. Start with the head. Man, it's your job to lead your family. That don't mean you go give her a hug and then start walking to the bedroom. <laughs> now, there has to be a trust there. A trust that there is pure affection. Genuine affection. Genuine love. Significance, companionship. All right, I don't know what husband, I do know what your number one need is. Wife, I don't know it, but I know it's one of those. And I know you need all of them. promise you guys that if we'll take these and we will work on these and you will put these as a priority in your life remember our know, number one priority on this earth is who spouse if they're our number one priority then by George I better be learning right I better take time to learn and to grow and to cherish this relationship 